developed to tear down this structure, to make it a parking lot. And with vision and tenacity, they said, if we do that, we will lose an incredible chapter in the history of our nation. Dr. Martin Luther King credited these young men with igniting a spark that revitalized the modern civil rights movement. Within 60 days, 65 other cities across the South and in some cities in the North had replicated what began at the F.W. Woolworth lunch counter here. For Greensboro, it was a trying and difficult time. But for the nation, it was a coming of age. People who had never heard of Greensboro before saw it on the nation's press. Again, this was the infancy of television. And so as newspapers and others covered it, here was an example of kids staying on message, staying committed, where other places were being bombed and burned to the ground. At this place, there was none of that. So, you know, um, we didn't really have to have the policemen coming in with the billy clubs and the, the nightsticks and that type of things with the tear gas. So I think that's what really helped this to make become a success. We knew that as we took a step forward, there would be legions following us. Well, my parents were um, some of the people that came down. They didn't actually come in and sit down at the lunch counter, but they were outside picketing. And I remember me and my sisters having to stay home because mom and dad had gone downtown for some very important business. And you know, after they came back, they did explain to us what they had done, that they had been and they were just outside of the Woolworths picketing. I was really too young at that time to, to engage in it myself. But having my parents come back, you know, and know, knowing that they were a part of this, this, um, oh, history-making event, you know, I was really proud about that as well. It was an evolving process. Um, for any number of months, there had been building frustration at the notion not only of the preposterousness of the kinds of Jim Crow logs that made for segregating eating facilities, but additionally, you could go into an establishment such as the F.W. Woolworth store or the Crest Department store, which was just a block down the street, and purchase items, but were not allowed to eat at the lunch counter. You could get carry out. And so there was not just in this city, but across the South especially, protests that would flare up every once in a while about those practices. In the end, while a number of students had discussed this, and in fact, particularly the students that had been in College for Women, had talked about a plan. The four young men at North Carolina A&T State University decided that they had had enough. And so these four got together and said, it's time for us to take a stand. And they said, we're ready understanding that by making this decision, they imperiled their futures. Not only could they have been expelled, not only could they have been harmed, but in many cities, people had been killed. It was an accomplishment that we all shared. 
me, it was personal. For me, my mother looked upon the movement in different component elements. She felt that the way out of bondage was the enlightenment of our youth. I learned to look at a mountain as an opportunity. Because one day segregation and Jim Crow were going to have to come to an end. So this was um, the role that Greensboro played in it, the role that the ANT4 played in it. And as young students, with their energy and with their fearlessness, you know, the students, the, the adults had usually been the forerunners throughout the civil rights movement, protesting and demonstrating, but to have the students. Now, this was the students' form of direct action. Historically, black colleges and universities really produced foot soldiers in the civil rights movement in general and the city movement in particular. So there was respect for the role that education would play in all of these struggles. Those students, those four students coming here, were well rehearsed about what they were doing. They had been taught about not being aggressive. There was an understanding that this was a movement whose time had come. Back then, we weren't allowed to go in the stores and try on clothes. We had to go up and. I can remember my mom say, turn around, boy, and she would put the coat up to your, you know, up to your back, and then that's the way uh, we would, you know, get our clothes, whereas they had the dressing rooms, but we weren't allowed to go in. Um, well, I was born in 1956, so it kind of gave me some insight on some things. Even though I was a small girl, I do remember certain instances. I remember um, going on curfew and we had to come inside when it was just when it was getting dark and we had to come inside because of the civil unrest and everyone had to be in by dusk. I remember that vividly. I also remember the Carolina Theater. Growing up as a small girl here, now I have five sisters, and on Saturdays one of the things that we loved to do was go to the Carolina Theater on Saturday mornings. And my mama would always say, well, girls, you got your money? You know, yes, ma'am, we have our money. And she would let us go. And that's when I was maybe seven or eight or nine years old, and I had two older sisters. And we would go to the Carolina Theater, and we would have to go and sit up in the balcony. But I didn't reflect on it then that the reason why was because of, of the color of my skin. We would go, we would sit in the balcony, we would have purchased our popcorn and sodas and everything, and we would have a ball. But then I think by the time I got to be 12 years old, and I don't really remember how I found out per se, but me and my sisters found out that the reason why we had to sit in the balcony was because we were black. <sighs> I couldn't believe it. I was crushed. You mean because we're black? Oh, that really hurt. It really hurt because I didn't understand at the time the idea of segregation or Jim Crow. I just realized, you know, how we were growing up and things were different, but not to that magnitude. I was still a preteen, but segregation was real to me. My entire elementary, high school education was all in a segregated environment, though I was the daughter of a college professor. It was kind of difficult for some, you know, some of the places you couldn't go and you couldn't stay at this hotel or you couldn't stay at that hotel and they would restrict you uh, to, like, eating, you know, uh, they didn't want you sitting with them. You had to sit separate. And it, it was, um, you know, an eye opener, I would say. I think out of both the courageousness of these young men and the timing, you saw this ignite in a way that was unexpected. And now you just look at it, too. There was no internet during those days. There were no cell phones or, not, or nothing. But it spread like wildfire. Just the word of mouth 
just the insurgence that was needed and the reason that black people were just tired and were tired of being treated unfairly and we wanted the equal rights attributed to all citizens of the United States. I can vividly remember after the lunch counter had been integrated and I had a summer job. I was working through the neighborhood youth corps here in Greensboro. I worked at the old post office and I had um, my supervisor was a white lady, elderly white lady, but we got along great. You know, I had my typing skills in place and everything, I was really good. And then I would always go to the Woolworths to eat lunch and I would come back raving about, oh, I had the, my cheeseburger and french fries, the usual thing I always ate. And one day she decided, well, I think I want to go with you. So I said, well, good, come on and go, because I knew all of the, the waiters and the waitresses at Woolworths. After all, I went just about every day. So this day I was particularly proud because here I have my white supervisor is going to have lunch with me at the Woolworths. But, you know, that was a milestone, really, for me in my life, um, really being able to go to the Woolworths and sit down and eat, and then having my white supervisor accompany me. You and your generation hears a claim that we are emerging into a post-racial society. All either of you have to do is walk to a street corner and to hail a cab in Washington, D.C. or in Manhattan. And even today, a cab driver will go past me to pick you up because they will assume that where you are headed is going to be a safer environment than wherever I am headed. Until society has reached a point where it truly can determine what someone represents, not by the color of their skin, but the content of their character, then we will have a more just America.